Okay, good morning everyone. Um, and can I welcome everyone to the sixth meeting of 2019 of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone present to turn mobile phones or other devices to silent mode so they don't disrupt uh, this morning's meeting? Um, uh, full House this morning, no apologies have been received. I'm delighted to say we move to agenda item one, decision to take item items in private. The committee is asked to agree that it takes item six, consideration of evidence taken in private. Is the committee agreed? Thank you. We now move to agenda item two, which is in relation to subordinate legislation. And the committee will take evidence on the Carers Allowance Operating Scotland Order 2019 draft, which is subject to the affirmative procedure, and also the Carers Allowance Operating Scotland Regulations 2019 SSI 2019 forward slash 21, which is subject to the negative procedure. Can I therefore welcome the Cabinet Secretary for Social Security and Older People, Shirley Ann Somerville, MSP, along with uh, her officials, Veronica Smith, Cross Cutting Policy Officer, and Colin Brown, Solicitor, both from the Scottish Government. Thank you all three of you for coming along uh, this morning. Can I, can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement and then we'll move to questions. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Good morning, convener. Uh, can I welcome the opportunity to provide evidence today on the Carers Allowance Operating Scotland Order 2019 and the Carers Allowance Operating Scotland Regulations 2019. This is the first time the committee will hear evidence on social security operating legislation, which is to become an annual event. As you know, through the Social Security Scotland Act 2018, we committed to operate carers' assistance, disability assistance, employment injury assistance and funeral expense assistance on an annual basis. And we also committed to annually review all types of social security assistance. As you may recall, on the 12th of December last year, I wrote to the committee setting out our approach to the operating carers' allowance and to operating the carers' allowance supplement, and that they be operated by the Consumer Price Index, or CPI. I would like to highlight that the regulations today are about the uprating of those benefits and how it is measured and not um, about the level of the benefits itself. The place for that discussion was during the Scottish Budget deliberations, a process completed by the Parliament a matter of weeks ago. The order and regulations we are laying today are about how we ensure that the benefit levels we agree on as members of this Parliament retain their value. Committee will be aware that we introduced the Carers Allowance Supplement last summer to address the fact that the Carers Allowance is the lowest working age benefit. The supplement has brought Carers Allowance up to the level of Job Seekers Allowance and can rightly be hailed a success. It has put an extra £442 into over 77,000 carers' pockets in 2018-19, an increase of 13% and an investment in Scotland's carers of over £33 million. As I have previously explained to the committee, getting this extra money into carers' pockets as early as last summer was only possible because of the use of an agency agreement with the DWP. Without that, additional payments would have been delayed while the policy was decided and a system built to implement that. The agency agreement was drafted um, as it was to enable us to operate carers' allowance using CPI. As well as being the right mechanism to use in itself, it allows for a consistent approach across carer's allowance and the supplement. This approach will continue until we have our own regulations in place for the Scottish form of carer's allowance. We are committed to ensuring that benefits in Scotland keep pace with the cost of living. And let me now turn to the detail of how we achieve this. We will operate carer's allowance through powers in UK legislation. The draft order proposes that we operate carers' allowance according to the September 2018 Consumer Price Index. That was 2.4%. It is also the rate at which the Department of Work and Pensions will operate carers' allowance in England and Wales. The carers' allowance operating order will increase the weekly rate of carers' allowance from £64.60 weekly to £66.15. The order and the regulations will also make some adjustments to additional payments made to a few long-term recipients of carers' allowance, the adult dependency increase and child dependency increase. Both these payments have been abolished for new claims for many years, but remain for a small number of carers. The regulations we are laying also increase the carers' allowance earning threshold. This is the amount a carer can earn in a given week and still be eligible. This is increased from £120 to £123. There are also changes to the earnings thresholds related to the historical payments I mentioned. They are set out in detail in the draft regulations and mean for this small number of cases these elements increase by a few pounds. I next wish to speak on the annual uprate of the Carers Allowance Supplement. 
as agreed in the Social Security Act. No new regulations are required to affect this uprate. However, it is worth highlighting today, as it demonstrates the commitment we have made through that Act, that carers' allowance would match the rate at which job seekers' allowance would be paid if it had been uprated. Our approach to uprating will increase the supplement from the equivalent of £8.50 a week to £8.70 a week. This means that here in Scotland we are providing carers with an extra £452.40 a year compared to their counterparts south of the border. It represents an additional investment in carers by the Scottish Government of around £37 million in the next financial year. Overall, our total investment in carers through the Social Security in 2019 2020, taking into account of what we are providing through the carers allowance and the supplement is £320 million, an investment which I am sure you will agree is just and right for Scotland's carers. I am, of course, happy to take questions from the committee. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I'm sure there will be a few questions. I mean, I'd like to start off for our fellow committee members and um, maybe to ask a little bit about, about process, because obviously this, the statutory instrument affirmative is in relation to the uprating and obviously the debate yesterday in relation to what mechanism should be used for that uprating. But I'm just wondering um, if there's actually a future opportunity to look at the inflation of the pressures in uprating. And that's because when you did write to the committee on the 12th of December, and you explained the, the operating mechanism that would be used. And I, I won't go over that again, but I will read out one paragraph that, that, that refers specifically to that, and it's about operating in future years. Uh, and it says the process outlined above, that would be what you've explained, Cabinet Secretary, already, for operating uh, carers' allowance and carers' allowance supplement will continue annually until we have made our own carers' assistance regulations. However, when other benefits begin to be delivered, for example, funeral expenses assistance and young carers grant in 2019, there will be reporting requirements under Section 77 of the 2018 Act to consider the effects of inflation and report to the Scottish Parliament on what we intend to do. There will also be a duty under Section 78, 78 to operate funeral expenses assistance and young carers grant, which apply in 2021. Uh, please bear with me. Operating in these circumstances will require regulations under the super affirmative procedure involving scrutiny of the draft regulations by the Sc Scottish Commission in Social Security and affirmative procedures in the Scottish Parliament. That, that, I suppose that's a long way of saying in your reply or your letter to the committee in December last year. Will the government, in partnership with the, S the Social Security Commission, be looking at what mechanism is used at that point because there's a commitment, I think, on the face of the legislation that underpins all of this, that when we take on full delivery uh, in Scotland, that there's a statutory duty to look at the, the inflation, the pressures, and how it will be operated. Thank you. You raise a very important point about how um, this um, process will progress over the years as the agency begins to deliver more and more um, benefits. Um, some of those um, will be dealt with in, in different ways, um, depending on what's in the Social Security Act. But you are quite right to point to the role of the uh, Commission uh, to look at every draft regulation that, that comes our way. So I would say there's a statutory obligation for us to ensure that we are um, outlining our plans to Parliament, to the committee, going through that in detail about um, coming to decisions on uprating. But for those that require um, regulations, that will obviously go through the Commission as well. I did, of course, um, make the uh, commitment um, in the debate yesterday with reference to the Conservative amendment, that the government will, of course, look at different options. Um, I know that we've already done that during this uh, process, uh, but as with all aspects of the social security system, we have said we are open to discussions uh, with political parties, uh, with the committee, to be able to look at different options if they're out there. So this is what the government has determined is the correct way forward. And I 
hope the committee passes that today, uh, but both um, on a, a level within Parliament and within our statutory obligations, we will of course uh, look at to see whether there are other options available in the future. I'm still content that this is the correct way um, and having looked at all the other options, I would be surprised um, if there was uh, something that changed my mind on that. But I am open, of course, to those discussions and to see what can come forward from that. Um, just one final question from myself, Cabinet Secretary. I'll reserve any additional comments to the, the debate we have on the, ne the next agenda item on, 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 these, on these matters. But a much more concise way, I suppose, to my previous question is that by the year 2020-2021, when carers' allowance becomes carers' assistance, there are statutory obligations on government to look at inflationary pressures when deciding the operating mechanism. That would be my understanding of the situation. Of statutory ob obligations as we pass every single piece of legislation, whether that's on carers' assistance or on any of uh, other of the payments that are going forward through regulations. OK, and the reason for asking that question is it allows this committee to return to that in a structured, process-driven, evidence-based way at a later date, as statute dictates, rather than anything else that may happen th this morning. Um, any other questions in relation to that? Mark Griffin. Thanks, Camilla. Um, I have some questions on um, both instruments, but if I start on the earnings threshold, um, the paper that the government have provided to committee has said um, and I'm quoting here, as the increase to carers' allowance earning threshold ensures that the benefits people receive maintain the current situation, then it's considered that there is no significant impact on the private, voluntary or public sector. Do you still agree with that statement contained that this maintains the current situation, given the impact, the changes to the level of uh, national living wage will, will have on working carers? Um, well, yes, I, I do. I appreciate that uh, uh, that I have a, a difference of opinion um, with uh, the Labour Party, as demonstrated yesterday, on how we should measure the, the operating. But I am content that this is the correct way to operate, and that is this is the best measure of inflation that we have to ensure that inflationary measures are, are taken into account. So, so yes, I do. Yeah. I mean, this isn't really about a difference of, of opinion at, at the moment. This is just the, the factual situation. The, this, the, the factual situation is that um, this year, a carer on the national living wage would be able to work 15 hours and 20 minutes. Under the new earnings threshold, a carer will only be able to work for 15 hours on a national living wage. So a, a carer will have to go to their employer and ask for a reduction in their weekly working hours to still maintain the eligibility for carers' allowance. And as we all know, that's it's a significant cliff edge um, to go over um, just by one penny to lose your entire entitlement. Just wonder whether you would reflect on that and the, the position that working carers will be in through no um, change of their own, that they will have to go to their employer and ask to reduce their working week. I do absolutely appreciate the the um, the cliff edge that is there for uh, the the carers' assistance, um, and do appreciate that um, those difficult conversations that carers may have. I suppose what this comes down to is um, whether we should have different rules here in Scotland for carers than is already present in the carer's allowance within uh, as run by the DWP. If uh, you would want to change those thresholds in a way that is different to the DWP, then we would have to renegotiate um, agency agreements and so on to allow those changes to be able to take place. Now, we have the agency agreement in place, as I mentioned during my opening remarks, to ensure that we got uh, very quickly payments into carers' pockets after the, the Social Security Act was passed by the Parliament. Now, that was a decision which the government took to ensure that we ensured that payment. 
and um, those other aspects of the rules around, for example, working age carers are aspects which can be looked at as we move to a form of uh, Scottish assistance to carers. Do you not regret, though, that a carer will have to ask for a reduction in their working hours as a result of uh, the changes to the threshold combined with changes to the national living wage? We had a choice. At the time when the Act was passed, we signed an agency agreement with the DWP that allows £442 into the pockets of the lowest income carers, or we take the time to set up the policies and implement a, a system that would allow us to, to deliver a Scottish system for carers' allowance. And that, by um, pure fact, we wouldn't have been able to deliver the money as quickly to carers. That was a choice that we took. It was a choice that the then Cabinet Secretary, Angela Constance, made clear to Parliament uh, some time before. Now, Mr McGriffin may think that that was the wrong choice, that we should have delayed the carers' allowance and put in carers' um, assistance more quickly in Scotland, but I would disagree with that, and I think the fact that we've made that quick payment to carers has been warmly welcomed. This is the first step in what we will do with carers, and it was our first priority when we took over Social Security powers. Fin finally, can we on the, on the earnings threshold, just to ask... Um, whether you, Cabinet Secretary, have been in touch with the UK Government to inquire about any flexibility in the threshold which would allow carers in Scotland to maintain their working hours? We have signed an agency agreement with the DWP which ensures that we will move forward with the carers allowance as it is currently delivered. If we wanted to reopen that agency agreement, to discuss any changes to that agency agreement, we could, of course, get into that. That would then take us away from delivering the disability benefits, uh, which would take us away from plans to uh, devolve the rest of the social security system. So we could look at those changes and the DWP would tell us how much that that would cost the Scottish Government. Or we can use this into uh, arrangement that we have to move very quickly forward with the disability assistance packages that we're doing. Okay. Um, I've got other questions on the, the other instrument, but I don't know if you want to give other members the opportunity to finish off your line, line, line of questioning while other members in. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks, Kavina. Um, I have a, a quote here. Um, which is a consumer price index does not adequately reflect the cost of living and that moreover the Treasury must already know that because it uses RPI whenever it wants to justify an increase in taxation. Would you agree with that characterisation on um, the difference between CPI and RPI? Well, what we've done when we've looked at what we will measure inflation by is the agreements uh, that has had, for example, from the Office of National Statistic, uh, the Bank of England, uh, the Chair of the UK Statistics Authority, um, that have all um, suggested and concluded that there are deficiencies in the use of RPI um, and that CPI is, is a better measure of um, inflationary pressures. Um, so that's the, the work that I've looked at in coming to that decision that we've placed forward before the committee today. Okay, well, that quote was from um, Jamie Hepburn, one of your ministerial colleagues, um, and I think that reflects quite clearly the government's position in that um, when it takes money in from citizens, um, it considers the RPI method to be appropriate, and we see that with Real fares, but when it comes to paying citizens, it is content to use CPI, which has um, been at a lower level historically. But I would just like to ask about the um, process. Now, I did ask questions of the Cabinet Secretary when um, you appeared, when we were scrutinising the budget, and asked for further detail on your deliberations and uh, methodology and how you came um, to the conclusion that CPI would be the, the preferred option. And in response to that, we have um, a single paragraph in a, a letter. It doesn't go into 
um, any detail as to the methodology or how you came to that conclusion. And given that this is such a significant um, stage in the creation of social security um, payments in Scotland, do you not think that a wider debate and more than just a, a paragraph and a letter would have been more beneficial when we're talking about such an important precedent of setting the, the, the rate of um, uplift in social security payments? Certainly, if the committee was not content with the paragraph, I would have been more than happy to respond to another letter from the committee to ask for more detail um, at that time. I'm not aware that that um, response um, was requested from me. But if I can go into some detail at this point, if it may help Mr Griffin about why we've done what we've done. RPI is an erratic measure of inflation that greatly um, overestimates and sometimes underestimates changes in prices. I give the example of the fact that you can have a negative rate for RPI. For example, in 2009, when the RPI changed over 12 months to September 2019 by minus 1.4%, that is um, mainly due to the erratic nature of housing costs being involved um, within that. Uh, there's not one single measure of um, inflation, obviously, so we did look at different aspects of it. Um, we looked at, as I think we discussed in the debate yesterday, and I mentioned we did look at CPIH um, as well, but again, as I mentioned in the debate, I think from memory, seven out of the nine last years would have involved a a, a, a smaller increase in the payment, larger uh, rather than a, a, the increase when, co when compared to CPI. So we ruled out uh, CPI. Retail price index, as I said, doesn't meet international uh, standards for the designation as a national uh, statistic. It's heavily um, influenced by house prices. Um, the ONS, the UK Statistics Authority, the Bank of England have discouraged the use of RPI. Legacy requirements have allowed it to still be recognised um, in some areas, but there is um, a suggestion um, and a recommendation indeed from authorities that that should be moved away from. Um, as I say, I've discussed the CPIH indicator and what that would have included. So I hope that gives more detail um, again of some of the aspects that we looked at and the reasons why we came to the decision that we did. And finally, Kimiran, um, thanks for letting me pursue this line of question extensively. Finally, is on consultation um, in the papers that you have provided, um, you have said that you have relied on the, the consultation for the um, Social Security Bill in itself. And again, I would ask you to reflect on the significance of the operating mechanism that we are um, being asked to accept here in the precedent that sets for all devolved Social Security payments that whether in fact an individual consultation um, on the uprating mechanism would have been more appropriate. Um, given that um, the responses to the consultation that you refer to in the paper um, just sets out that the majority of stakeholders agreed that um, devolved benefits needed to keep pace with the cost of living and doesn't reflect the range of submissions that some um, supported RPI, CPI uh, and others that given the um, the precedent that we're setting and how important um, operating mechanisms would be that a consultation would have been valuable. There's no statutory requirement to consult on this instrument, but it was it's, uh, within the consultation uh, within the Social Security um, Act that we ran. That consultation included a chapter on up rating and sought the views of stakeholders on the best way to ensure that benefits keep up the pace with the cost of living. Mr Griffin is quite right to point out that there were differing views uh, within that. There is, say, there's no agreed definition of inflation, therefore it would be it's not unsurprising that there was no uh, um, agreement over what uprating should be done. But that consultation was uh, completed as the, the bill uh, progressed. Um, I would again point out to uh, a fact that the convener raised in questionings that when we bring forward um, uprating regulations under the 2018 
Act, they will, of course, be subject to independent scrutiny from the Commission. So that there will be um, um, very clear independent scrutiny that will take place during the regulations. This is not a, a one-off uh, decision that's made today that will carry on, but we will very much be in a process um, of going forward on this on, on an annual basis. And particularly when we're bringing forward regulations, they will be independently scrutinised by the Commission. Thanks, okay, I know that was an extensive line of questioning, but it's important that, that, that we, we, we have that, that, that level of scrutiny. Uh, remind everyone, if they've got wider comments, to make there's an opportunity in the next agenda item to, to, to do that. Uh, Alison Johnson. Yeah, um, I appreciate the Scottish Government is currently constrained by, well, committed by the agency agreement with the UK Government to uprate carers' allowance in line with their plans, but... Before carers' assistance comes online, we've been having a discussion about how we operate, but how can we be sure that we've got the actual amount correct in the first place? You know, we heard yesterday um, in considerable detail during the debate about the financial, sometimes very negative financial impact caring can have because people are giving up work. It can be costly caring for, for one, if not more people. So, uh, you know, can you assure us that the government will be carrying out extensive consultation with carers themselves and with the organisations that represent them before you come to that decision? I mean, certainly, I mean, I'm in uh, constant uh, contact with stakeholders when we move forward with Social Security and carers' organisations are, of course, no, no different. I meet with them regularly on this and many other issues. You are quite right to point out there um, was, I, I think, a um, quite a few speeches yesterday that, that pointed to some of the, these um, areas where we need to take a more holistic view of what was happening with carers and whether the government had indeed got the level of carers allowance supplement right. And that's an absolutely valid debate for the parliament to have and to question, um, to question the, the, the government on. Um, we are, um, we think that the supplement has made a tremendous difference to carers. There may be views within the Parliament, of course, which think we should go further, and that is absolutely quite right and proper. As I pointed out during my introductory remarks, that's a discussion that I kind of, of course had on an annual basis during the budget process, as we discuss all the decisions that the government makes on social security and on other aspects about whether we've got the policies right and we've got the levels right. I think we've done um, an a, a good job at delivering our first priority for carers as we move forward with the carers allowance supplement but that is a determination for parliament and indeed the different political parties uh, to, to challenge us and whether we've we've got that right thank you thank you okay um deputy convener good morning cabinet secretary uh, just three questions um yes i just want to clear my own mind before the debate so um so no legislation is required to affect the up rate, um, but it is open to the Scottish Government in future, um, if you were persuaded, that's a choice you could make to change the... the required for carers allowance yep. supplement uh, but as I said during the debate yesterday I know there are differing views on this we have committed to um, to carrying on those discussions um, and to hear those suggestions I'm content with the fact that we have already taken um, a great deal of time and thought within government to do that but um, of course this is a, an area where uh, people will have different opinions on in, in the future I'm sure. You could choose, if, so I just wanted to get to that point, that it's a, it is a choice that you've made. Yeah, it's open. Okay, yes. Um, just in relation to the questions from Mark Griffin on the question of the earnings. So I noted what you said, that it might be difficult conversations for some carers uh, who might find themselves over that threshold. Um, is that something that was known? Was this an issue that arose in the in the course of making decisions about the operating? The decisions that we take 
Um, our essence built on the fact that we do have an, an agency agreement, and I go back to, um, mm -hmm. I, I won't reiterate the, 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 the point um, too far, but I go back to the reasons why we took out that agency agreement in the first place, to ensure that we could get money into carers' pockets. And now, um, if any other changes were required that would make what we're doing in Scotland different to what was happening in England, that would have to um, involve a renegotiation of the agency agreement and it would uh, require the DWP to tell us whether there was a cost to the Scottish Government of changing what they are doing uh, for Scottish clients rather than what's happening in England. So the choice was taken to, to move to an agency agreement to allow us to pay the carers allowance supplement. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that and I appreciate why you took that decision but you would accept that the sort of downside to that is that some carers will have to, the difficult conversations that you talk about with employers for a lot of people means they will lose their entire entitlement. Well, the challenge is you either have an agency agreement or you don't. If you don't have the agency agreement, then you need to set up an entirely different system to deal with the areas where we know people want to see in, in carers' assistance. If you don't have the agency agreement, you can make those changes. You wouldn't have got any changes in, um, in the speed that we delivered the carers' allowance supplement. That's a choice that the government took. Just one me. A tiny question about your RPI being an erratic measure. Now, I'll confess up front, it's not my specialist subject, but the, I was just interested in the, the year that it was used, 2009. I, I'm very conscious that 2009 was a year after the crash. And it obviously is an ongoing discussion about the question of housing costs. And the fact that housing costs are a major factor of pushing people into poverty, etc. Um, I just wondered if you'd had looked beyond the year 2009. I just wondered if you would acknowledge that the specific year that, you, that you've quoted to the committee is a kind of strange year, just because that was one year after the crash, where things were... The, the country was, was erratic, and I just wondered if you had taken that into... It was um, one year after the crash, which was a, a major economic event that um, caused great difficulty for the country. And we can only imagine other examples of uh, great economic events that may come across the country that we don't have any control over over the next year um, or two that might also cause RPI to be erratic as well. Um, but it's not just the example that happened just after um, the crash. It is, in essence, um, an erratic example of um, a, a, a cost, of a, a, a way of measuring um, um, in inflation. That's not just because when large economic events happen like a crash, that is something um, which is ongoing. And what has led the um, ONS and um, others to suggest, this isn't the Scottish Government's view, this is um, independent agencies coming to the view that it's an erratic measure. Thank you. Okay, and I think the final question before we move to the next agenda item, um, Keith Brown. Uh, thanks very much, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I suppose it's two questions, just asking at the same time to uh, make it brief, and it follows on from that conversation. Um, there are reports in today's newspapers that there's been a significant setback in house prices because of Brexit. That's in the newspapers today. So if it was the case that played out, and depending on what happens with the kind of shambolic Brexit process, if there was a reduction, a substantial and sustained reduction in house prices, does that open up the possibility that people receiving this allowance if it was RPI, including housing costs, could end up with a significantly reduced operating or even uh, a, a down rating, if you like, a downgrading if, if housing costs um, were included, as it would be with RPI. And the second question, just on the agency agreements and the point about changes, and I don't know whether it's possible to say or not, are you able to give us any idea what the likely cost of seeking and getting a change to the agency agreement, my previous experiences, this can be very expensive. You know, are you able to give us any sort of scale of £5 million, £1 million, £10 million? And 
in any event, does the Scottish Government have any say over that? Is there any kind of bargaining or is it just the price that's given to you by the DWP? Well, in terms of um, Brexit coming up, I'm not going to even attempt to forecast what inflation might look like over the, the next year when we have no idea what's going to happen in the next uh, couple of weeks. But you are quite right to point out that um, at times where there are economic challenges and there are economic circumstances that are disadvantageous to the housing market, that will have an impact on RPI in a way, of course, which we wouldn't have on CPI because it's not contained within that. That is, in essence, the reason why it's a more erratic measure of uh, inflation than, than CPI and is the reason why we've, we've not chosen to go um, around that way. On the aspect of cost, it, it isn't, I suppose, um, possible to uh, put a, a price on it because we have not asked for a change because we're concentrating on getting on with the devolution of the disability and, and carers' benefits and anything that involved us trying to renegotiate a, an agency agreement would, of course, take away people uh, from that work of the devolution of, of benefits. Uh, but the, so the cost for change would, would need to be looked into on an individual basis, of course, depending on what we're looking for. Uh, you are quite right to point out it is not within our gift to decide what that cost would be. It is for the DWP uh, to suggest what that is. And obviously, the Scottish Government in turn works very hard to ensure that that cost is kept to uh, a minimum and to ensure that we are delivering the best value for, for uh, Scottish taxpayers. Uh, but that's not something that is chosen by the Scottish Government. That is something that would have to come from negotiations with the DWP. I do now have a, a bid for a late, late question. I, I, I'm just conscious of time. It's really important we get the maximum opportunity to scrutinise here. So apologies, Mr Balfour, but quite briefly, please. I think it's a yes or no. I think in one of your statements you said, uh, Cabinet Secretary, that if you went back to DWP to renegotiate, that might then delay the other benefits coming forward, such as PIP, etc. Is that, is that correct? That, that might be, I mean, I'm not saying it would be, but it would be a danger that you wouldn't be able to deliver the other benefits as planned if you had to go back and renegotiate with DWP. Well, I suppose I'll put it this way. I, I am exceptionally fortunate to be supported in my work by um, an exceptional bunch of um, civil servants and um, agency staff. Uh, there are no directorate or agency staff sitting around looking for something else to do. So if anyone was taken off, um, if anybody had to go around to then renegotiate agency agreements, they would have to be taken off um, other work. They are obviously working exceptionally hard uh, to ensure that we deliver at pace on social security. And I don't want them to have to delay any of that work because we are looking at what would be in effect an interim solution as we move forward with, with the devolution of benefits. Thank you, Camille. Okay, I think we've had a good session there in relation to uh, questions, Cabinet Secretary. We'll now move to uh, agenda item three, uh, which is still subordinate legislation, and can invite that there will be a debate to follow, but at the moment, for the moment, can invite Ms. Fort Summerall to move the motion S5M 15926 that the Social Security Committee recommends that the carers allows operating order 29 be approved. Can I ask you to move that particular motion just Moves, now? Moves, convener. Uh, there now is the opportunity for, for a debate. I'd appeal that any debate be a short debate, given the time constraints that we have, but would any members like to make a comment at this stage? Mr Griffin. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, I mean, I've touched on it on, on earlier um, questions, but I think this is such a, a momentous decision, such a momentous stage in the devolution of social security entitlement that the um, method of uprating um, really deserves a, a wider conversation, a wider discussion, a wider consultation, a wider debate before we are considering um, a method of operating um, that we that we use. Members who were on the committee um, who scrutinised the legislation will know that the committee were concerned 
about this exact uh, position that we could find ourselves in, where um, regulations would come um, before committee that were take it or leave it um, without um, a high level of um, consultation, scrutiny, uh, debate, because of the nature of how the Social Security Bill was um, drafted and how reliant that um, piece of legislation was on uh, regulations. And it, so it transpired that we are now in this position uh, where, like I say, we are taking such a momentous decision, um, such a key milestone on the progress to full devolution of those um, Social Security entitlements that it's done so um, without yesterday's debate, almost uh, with no debate at all. And when it comes to the actual um, decision, uh, the government, you yourself, your predecessors are, are on record in, in criticising the UK government for exactly the policy you intend to, to implement. Um, regularly, ministers and members come to the chamber and talk about the almost £4 billion that has been cut from social security spending. And then your own um, briefings that you received when you assumed your position, um, that is set out clearly that the coalition uprating policies, i.e. changing from RPI to CPI, um, up to 2021 will cost recipients of Social Security in Scotland £1.9 billion. And yet we continue with this method of CPI, like I say, with little or almost no debate in the absence of um, it being brought to the Chamber yesterday. If the UK Government had continued with RPI, carers would be almost £1,000 better off at this point. So, for those reasons, Commissioner, um, I can't support um, the decision to um, uprate by CPI, um, given that I feel there has been a complete lack of real debate and discussion um, when it comes to this. It's such a huge, huge point, and I'm really concerned about the, the precedent it would set. Okay. Thank you, Mr Griffin, for putting that on the record. Um, are there any other comments from members? Ms. Mr Brown, followed by Ms Ballantyne. Hey, I'm happy to support it. Um, I think if it's as uh, hugely significant as has just been suggested, then there really should have been an amendment to the budget. Uh, when that was being considered, there was no amendment to the budget. There was not the significance attached to this at that time. I think it's also true to say that people seem to be quite happy to see um, a situation where the Scottish Government's had a cumulative cut of over £2 billion to its budget. There's been no RPI increases in the Scottish Government's budget over the last nine years. Um, and yet, uh, once again, more has been asked of the Scottish Government than has been given to them to actually undertake. And over the last few weeks, we've seen so many different demands to increase funding for all sorts of things. I mean, the Scottish Welfare Fund, even though it was underspent, uh, demand for that to be increased, but I've seen no suggestions as to where that money should come from. So I think it's hard to uh, see the logic of that. And also, I think what um, has been said tries to take away from the fact about how much has been done by carers by the new uh, social security provisions in Scotland. It's a, a major step forward. Um, so for those reasons, uh, and also the fact that if, say we uh, manage to convince the Scottish Government to accede to a request to revert to RPI, and if, Brexit has a major impact on the housing market. Are we going to be here next year demanding a return to CPI, CPI to protect um, uh, carers in that regard? So, for those reasons, I'm more than happy to support um, the motion. Commissioner Brown, uh, Michelle Ballantyne. Yes, good morning. Um, I have some sympathy um, with Mark Griffin's um, position around worrying that things will come and there'll be a tick box exercise, and I, I do absolutely get that. I think on this particular issue, it is fundamentally very complicated because RPI has been found to be flawed and there have been a lot of calls for it to be fixed and those, those calls have been resisted. So what, what this debate is actually about is two things. It's about you know, whether or not we should debate and look at how we operate. Um, and I, I totally agree with that. And, and that was why we, we asked for and, and got a very welcome guarantee from the Cabinet Secretary yesterday that it will be looked at consistently as we go along. And that is obviously important. And if RPI was fixed 
and they, they corrected the flaws. And actually, the flaws, ironically, are around um, clothing estimates, not about housing. So, you know, some of this discussion is, is slightly off, off beat in terms of what the actual problems are. But you cannot, it would be irresponsible of a government to suggest that we used a flawed measurement as a starting point for a new system. Um, and it's for that reason that I support where the government are. But I absolutely do think that it is important we keep reviewing that. And if RPI was to be fixed, um, I doubt whether it is going to be any time soon because it's linked to the, the gilt market um, and it would have significant effects on the gilt market. And I think the last gilt expires in something like 2066 or something. So I suspect we're going to have to wait quite a long time for anybody to be willing to fix it. But I think the depth of understanding of that is, is actually slightly the responsibility of members when they come to debate this. Um, and I certainly would never be calling a, for us to use a statistically flawed method of uprating. Um, I think it would be irresponsible, and it's for that reason I support what the government is doing at the moment. Um, and I think it's beholden on us as a committee to get that depth of understanding individually and to bring to the debates. Um, and I think if we do that, we might not like it, and we might see other issues that are caused by it. But I think it is in inherent on us to actually understand that we either need to call for those fixits to be made and, and push that, or find an alternative or look at the thing in the round. Um, and I hear very much about what you're saying about cliff edges, et cetera, but that actually is a different issue to the uprating. So I don't think we should conflate those issues, and I think we need to, to look at them separately and figure out how we do the best for our carers along the way. So for that reason, I'm, I'm supporting the position today, um, but I do empathise with where you're coming from. OK, a few more bids um, for, um, for speaking in the debate. Deputy Convener. Uh, thank you very much. Um, first of all, can I put on record my thanks to the Cabinet Secretary for answering questions in a straightforward way. Um, I don't agree with everything that has been said, and I've always recognised um, the importance of the work the Scottish Government has done in introducing the supplement, and I hope that goes without saying. Um, but through the amendment procedure, um, the committee and the Government were quite clear that there should be an annual operating mechanism. And I think it's quite important, as Mark Griffin says, that it's healthy to have a debate at what the uh, guidance that we use for that operating mechanism to uh, as what inflation is a true reflection of people's actual living costs. There is a huge distrust, distrust around the use of CPI, of CPI adopted by the UK government in 2010. That distrust goes wider than members of this committee. It's also distrusted by a number of third sector organisations and I think that has to be taken into account. I don't see it as a budget issue. I see it as a point of principle and that we adopt a measure which we may have a difference of opinion, but I want to, us to see adopt a measure which actually uh, truly reflects people's um, costs and housing costs is an essential cost for people um, in that calculation. I'm also concerned about the earnings issue. Now, I've noted what the Cabinet Secretary had to say about things that you have to weigh up in terms of the agency agreement, but it distresses me deeply that we don't know the numbers, but some carers will lose their complete entitlement um, because of a lack of flexibility around this. Um, I do welcome the fact that we may have a future discussion on this, and that I know you've said that you're content that this is the correct way, but I hope you will keep an open mind um, going forward, uh, no one would want to support a statistically flawed um, process. Um, but I certainly believe that CPI for this purposes of today is the wrong one, and I can't support today. Okay. T time is almost upon us. Um, I think it's Jeremy Balfour, and then we'll to Alison Johnson. Apologies, Alison. <coughs> I, I mean, I do actually also welcome um, Mark Griffin's uh, debate, because I do think there is an issue here. I mean, I personally do support the government on this one. But I think there's something that we as a committee need to have a dialogue with Scottish Government on is in regard to how these future regulations will be debated. Because I think one of the concerns we did have when the bill was going through that we were leaving a lot to regulation, um, as Mark Griffin has said, and there is a danger you either have to, you can like 75% of it, but you still, you can't amend it. And I do think we do need to with other, mem with other regulations coming forward, find a mechanism where these can be debated and discussed 
without just then having to vote yes or no right at the end. And I think we had a bit of a discussion about that earlier on, using third parties to do that. But I do think it is, a, it is an important point to note going forward that we don't want to end up with having to maybe like a lots of regulation, but there's one or two things we'd have to vote against it. So I do think just going forward, convener, as a committee, we just need to have a think and a dialogue of how we do that in, in, in a way that is open, uh, gives scrutiny, but also doesn't delay decisions. Um, thank you very much, Mr Balfour. Um, I'm just checking. I'll make a contribution uh, b before then, but I've got Alison Johnson for the moment. I don't see any other bids to speak. I'm just conscious of time constraints. Alison Johnson. Yeah, um, thank you, Convener. Um, I, I think it's widely recognised that the Greens support RPI rather than CPI in this situation. But I also have, you know, I understand that um, the Scottish Government is locked in to operating at the same CPI rate as the UK Government at the moment. And is there an alternative to the, the agency agreement? Um, so I do find this a very difficult situation, but I do find the situation in which we find ourselves this morning quite unsatisfactory um, on both counts. And I, I, you, you know, the, I think that's being ex expressed fairly widely across the committee. And for those reasons this morning, I am going to abstain. Okay. Thank you, Alison, for making your position clear. Any other members? OK. Um, can I make a few remarks before we move to the Cabinet Secretary for summing up during the debate? Um, I take my, my position as scrutinising uh, the work and delivery of Social Security by the Scottish Government as committed to this committee very seriously. Hopefully that was clear by the extensive questioning we wanted Mr Griffin to have this morning, given his very specific interest in it. Um, I'm sympathetic to an evidence-led, uh, methodical approach to looking at what, what measure should be used for operating uh, benefits and entitlements um, in relation to thresholds and, and benefit levels? Absolutely. And if that's an item of work this committee wishes to carry out, we absolutely should do that. I would put on record that the details of the operating of Carers Allowance and Carers Allowance Supplement was provided to this committee on the 12th of December 2018, some 11 weeks ago. It wasn't until the last couple of days that there was particularly any issues raised in relation to that. Now, I read that letter at that point. It was received, and I referred very specifically to um, operating in future year section contained within the Cabinet Secretary's letter, which quite clearly states that when we move from carers' allowance uh, to carers' assistance, when uh, the Scottish Government and the Scottish Social Security Scotland takes control over that benefit, that the Scottish Social Security Commission will have a statutory role to play. And that's quite clear. That would seem an absolutely appropriate time for this committee to have a substantial look at the levels of benefits and how they are operated. And I think that would be the appropriate way for this committee to do our business, particularly given that we've had that information from the Scottish Government for the last 11 weeks. I think it's disappointing that actually what we're really looking at today is an additional £37 million investment into the hands and pockets of carers who do an amazing job. Um, and if what we're doing is talking about the level of benefit, then let's have that discussion. And that discussion is absolutely at budget time. Whether there are consequences for any financial asks to government from backbenchers or opposition parties. And I think the figure given was an additional £3 million into the pockets of carers. So if, if the political discussion we're going to have is how best to spend £3 million additional into the pockets of carers, let's have a frank discussion about where that money comes from and the best way to spend that money. Is it changing the operating mechanism? Is it uh, looking at the Young Carers Grant and extending that? Is it looking at respite care? For carers, there's a whole variety, there's a wider package that we could look at to improve the lot of carers. So, um, in terms of the committee and the scrutiny we have, I think we have to continue to do that absolutely without fear or favour in relation to the level of benefits uh, in Scotland and how they are operated. But opposing an affirmative instrument, which will effectively mean less money, not more money for carers, is an irresponsible uh, way of doing business in my personal opinion, although ironically, I do commend Mark Griffin for raising the wider issue because there are some underlying discussions there in 
areas of scrutiny that our committee should absolutely engage with. So others have had the opportunity to see where they are in relation to the debate we've had this morning, and this was my opportunity to put some of my thoughts on the record. The Cabinet Secretary, um, I actually think quite a high-quality debate from committee members here, here this morning. You have the opportunity to sum up in relation to that debate. Thank you, Convener, and I appreciate that opportunity. As uh, some members have pointed out, the, uh, the, the first time that I raised this with committee formally was on the letter that I sent in December 2018, which set out in detail what we would propose for the carers' allowance and the carers' allowance uh, supplement. So that is um, some opportunity of time for the committee to have reflected on that. And I would, of course, been happy to have provided any further evidence or appear before committee at a future, um, at an earlier point, had that request uh, came in to have that wider debate. And I'm, of course, uh, more than happy to do that in the future. I think it has been a very informative debate, not just on the particular regulations that we are looking at today, but also the wider points that uh, Jeremy Balfour and others have, have raised around how we do deal with regulations as we move forward with Social Security. Uh, the, the letter in December 2018 was, uh, the was uh, my um, first opportunity to be able to make clear my direction of travel on this issue, but I'm mindful whether there's more that needs to be done to ensure that committee is, is aware and has opportunities. Going forward, I hope that Mr Balfour and others will, of course, be reassured that Section 77 of uh, the Act that was passed requires me to report to Parliament and to discuss those issues and, of course, to be held accountable for those issues. The draft regulations, as the convener points out, will go forward to the Commission for independent scrutiny and will be available um, for uh, the committee and, of course, uh, wider stakeholders to be able to take a view on and to require um, evidence. And again, I'm more than happy uh, to take part at that uh, point uh, for any deliberations um, on that. That. So I'm mindful of the, 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 the points that we've raised today, that people still have concerns about what we have chosen as a, a measure of inflation. As I said yesterday, I'm more than happy uh, to, to hear those uh, discussions going forward with uh, this. Uh, and, and again, the wider point, I think, of how we deal with regulations with the Act is something which I look at very seriously and, and reflect on. And I'm, of course, um, available to the committee at any point should any further uh, questions be raised on that issue. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, so, given that the debate is concluded, um, the question is, is the committee content to recommend approval of this instrument? Is the committee agreed? No. OK. If the committee is not agreed. We will therefore move to a division. I'll just check that we're ready. OK. Uh, those for the motion, please show. You got that? Uh, those against the motion, please show. Indeed. Yes. Those abstaining. Okay. So it is agreed to. Okay. The, the, the vote being six for, two against, and one abstention. So the motion is agreed to. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, for coming along this morning. Uh, we now move to agenda item four, but we'll suspend briefly just allow for uh, the Cabinet Secretary team to, to leave. Thank you.
you everyone. We'll now move to agenda item four, which is still subordinate legislation, and the committee is invited to note that Carers Alliance Operating Scotland Regulations 2019 SSI 29 forward slash 21. Um, so we're asked to note that. Is the committee content to note that particular instrument? Yeah. We are. Thank you. Uh, we now move to agenda item five. Uh, and the committee will take evidence from Social Security Scotland. And can I welcome David Wallace, Chief Executive, and James Wallace, Head of Finance, Social Security Scotland, and also Alison Byrne, Deputy Director, Social Security Programme Delivery Support, Scottish Government. Um, can I ask if there's any opening remarks, perhaps, Mr Wallace, you want to give before we move to a discussion? I, I'm very conscious of time, but I do have a couple of remarks, if that's, if that's Yes, permissible. of course. Um, so, firstly, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, this uh, the sort of privilege of being Chief Executive of Social Security Scotland means you have lots of firsts, um, first payments, um, and etc. And this is my first appearance in front of you formally uh, as Chief Executive of Social Security Scotland. So thank you for that opportunity. Just a couple of things I wanted to kind of talk, uh, touch on very, very briefly, given time. And also, I know there's some areas that you'd like to explore as well. Uh, I very briefly want to just cover um, where we are as an organisation and how we've got there. I wanted to say a little bit around about the culture of the organisation that we're trying to, to build uh, and also a little bit more around about the information that we'd expect to start to generate uh, through you uh, in, in order to help your sort of scrutiny function around about performance as well. So in terms of background, as, as members are aware, uh, we opened for business uh, in September last year uh, with um, the Carers Allowance Supplement um, and I shall stop in terms of any more about Carers Allowance Supplement. Um, as of now, we employ just over 300 uh, staff uh, based across our headquarters in Dundee in Glasgow and we also now have a small cohort who are operating across Scotland in preparation for face-to-face -face, uh, local delivery. Um, in terms of getting to that point of launch, there was a huge amount of, of work has gone into getting us to that point. Again, I'm conscious that some members um, have, have visited the programme to, to see some of the complexity behind what's being achieved here. Uh, so there's an enormous amount of work to get to that point. Alison um, is, is from the, the programme side of the Scottish Government, and we continue to work incredibly closely uh, with our programme, our directorate, and uh, our chief digital officer colleagues to, to achieve what we need to achieve. I wanted to very briefly just draw out from an agency perspective uh, just some sort of key historic points for us. Uh, and if I could just take us back to, to March um, 2016, where we had created the Unfair Scotland uh, document. And that for us was our there, there will be an agency moment. Uh, I joined the directorate um, shortly after that. And on my particular remit at that point was to make that agency happen. We then had uh, a statement in Parliament in April 2017, our outline business case. And that outline business case is published and gives a lot of detail around about how the agency will operate, including that face-to-face -face delivery. Uh, that was the first time we sort of set out how many people the agency would likely employ. Uh, we'd said 1,500 across those two sites at that point, and also its kind of high-level operating model. Um, in May 2017, the Cabinet Secretary, as was then, also announced um, that Carers Allowance Supplement would be our first uh, benefit that we delivered, and that gave us our point of delivery in time as well. Very, very swiftly after that, in September 2017, uh, again with some published evidence in Parliament, we set out uh, our decision as to why we would end up in Dundee and in Glasgow. Uh, and I'm really quite proud to say that one year on from that, in September 2018, from essentially a standing start in the city of Dundee, we were able to deliver Carers Allowance Supplement, as you've been debating before, putting money into people's pockets in Scotland from, from that city. Moving on briefly to culture, uh, we've been taking um, a, a really kind of key role in trying to ensure that the workforce we have uh, is diverse and reflects the society broadly and, and our clients that we want to serve. Again, where some members have visited Dundee in particular to see that in, in action. Um, I just want to draw out that that, that isn't just an ethos, it's, a, it's some practical measures behind that. So one of the things that we've done on a very practical basis is that as we develop job adverts, we run those past stakeholders. We're trying to ensure that there are no language barriers around about how can people apply for our jobs. Um, we have removed um, qualif uh, minimal qualifications for our entry-level jobs, and that's allowed us to attract 
people into the organisation uh, who wouldn't otherwise have been able to be employed by the civil service. So a real uh, ability for us to expand our workforce. And we've also been really determined to offer people continuous feedback through those processes. So I'm delighted to say now in Dundee we have people who originally were unsuccessful in applying for the organisation and as a result of the work that we've done with them are now back and have been successfully employed. So we're really trying to embed that in everything we do. That, that goes through to our executive advisory body as well. So our advisory body and our non-executives have a broad range of experience and skills in, in, in the area that, of people that we service as well. Uh, and again, that's a very conscious move that we're trying to deliver on. Um, one of the other things we're doing is uh, building in through the Act and the Charter, getting continuous uh, service feedback from, from our clients. Um, we, we do that in a number of ways as, as services come on stream uh, and I'm, we may come on slightly more to that but I'm delighted to say up till now our, the feedback we've had from clients has been remarkably positive for the services that we've delivered uh, so we're very pleased with that. And at a more general level, um, obviously we'll start to, to publish more information around about the, the, the money that we are putting out through benefits um, and the impact that they are starting to, to have. I know there's been a set of official statistics released quite recently on the Carers Allowance Supplement, uh, so you should be aware of these. Um, but I'll just give you the high-level figures for that. You'll be aware that over 77,000 uh, payments of Carers Allowance Supplement were made in the first tranche. Uh, and as you've been debating, that gave, in that particular instance, over £17 million of money to carers in Scotland that would not otherwise have been paid. So we're incredibly proud of, of that. The, the next set of figures uh, will be released in May in terms of the uh, carers allowance supplement. Uh, over the, the sort of the coming period as well and into April, we'll also be producing official statistics around about Best Start Grant. Obviously, we've given some very early indications uh, as to how the Best Start Grant process has worked. Uh, but again, we'll be pushing something out which is official statistics, statistics in order for you to, to get that better feel. Um, I should also briefly say as well that um, in terms of that scrutiny and that transparency, we will of course be producing an uh, annual report and accounts, uh, which for this year will be a part year uh, set of accounts covering from uh, September when we launched until the end of March. Uh, and James here uh, would be happy to cover those uh, elements off and we're in discussions with Audit Scotland around about what that might look like as well. So hopefully that's given you a flavour of, of some of the activity that we've been doing and where we're currently at. I'm happy to take questions. Absolutely, and, and, th and thank you for, for that opening statement. Now, I'm conscious when committees do scrutiny, we sometimes look to see where the strains could be in the organisation rather than accentuate the positives, but I should just put on record that many of us took the opportunity to come and, and, and see you all in Dundee, um, and, and it was a real positive experience, and we're also able to see actually the, the commendation from... Uh, service users, the, the, the good positive feedback that you were getting from claimants uh, in relation to their experience. So I'm not going to ask you about the positive feedback, <laughs> funnily enough, uh, but it's important to put it on the record. But you can't always get things right all the time. Uh, as, as an agency, that's just a reality and a fact of life. So I, I would be interested to know, given the significant caseload that, that's starting to be built up, um, whether there has been... Um, a number of complaints received in relation to um, Carers Allowance Supplement or Best Start Grant. I know it's very much in its, in, in its infancy. And what your experience has been of d dispute resolution or appeals, if you like, in relation to that process? Um, could you give some more information in relation to that? Um, yes, I can. And again, for the reasons for official statistics, I, I, I'll give rounded sort of uh, flavour of where we're at rather than specific uh, numbers. Um, so in, in terms of, uh, first, firstly, um, is, is it complaints rather than appeals that you, you're particularly... Complaints. I, I, because of time, I had to try to roll two things together, but let's deal with complaints. Yeah. Um, in terms of the number of complaints, um, for BSG and Carers Alliance, we've had un, under 100, uh, is, is how I'd probably say at the moment. Um, so, so kind of... For both, for, both for, for, okay. across the across the piece, so uh, a, a phenomenal low level of complaints. The the vast majority of those are being what we're termed resolved at first line. So acknowledging, understanding what's driven a complaint, and, and 
very often just apologising and ensuring that that will fall, fall forward. But it's a, it's a phenomenally low level, so um, without wishing to only dwell on the positive, we still see that as a, as a positive. Uh, we may come on to the best start grant uh, element around about this, but one of the things which particularly struck me through, through that process as well is that we had a, 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 a relatively large number of calls immediately after launch for BSG um, but there was only um, one sort of recorded complaint that we had, which was around about how somebody had been treated on the phone. So there was, there was discussions about how it's taking longer than it anticipated. When will I receive? When will I know? There was these types of details, but we, we had only one where an individual indicated that they, they felt they had been inappropriately dealt with. So the 199 was in terms of process. One was in terms of if you like, the relationship they had with the, the individual who was the, rep the, the representative of, of, of the agency. Was there any, so from those 99 then, did any, it's a, it's a very, very small, it's a welcome small amount given the caseload, but were there any themes emerging from, from those that you, even at this early stage you could determine what the issues were? Um, the vast majority were actually in relation to the policy rather than necessary to service. So, um, uh, you know, ineligibility. So, so people will, um, you know, lodge a complaint uh, around about they, they, they are not receiving. Um, we would, you know, we would absolutely acknowledge, you know, that is a bit of feedback and make sure that goes back into into the wider discussions that we, we have, but in the, the, they tend not to be service complaints. Uh, on BSG in particular, as I'm sure we'll come on to, you know, the, the expectation around about how long it would take to get a payment, uh, the speed of processing and when would people receive was, was some elements. Uh, but remarkably, uh, most are around about policy. Okay, I, and I had conflated complaints with appeals. Could we perhaps maybe talk about, has there been any uh, appeals made? Um, well, obviously, people have to go through a redetermination process before they, they reach that point. Uh, so, again, we've had in the low, um, low hundreds uh, of uh, requests for redetermination. Um, we, we are working through those. Again, we have our, our very set timescales to work through redeterminations. We have considered um, just over 100 uh, requests for redetermination. Um, and broadly speaking, um, we are probably um, changing the decision in around about a third of those cases. OK, um, so that, that's a third. And of the two thirds where you don't change at redetermination, how many of those then move on to a kind of formal appeals process? Um, I probably need to be careful so I don't tread on official statistics because the, the number is one at the moment. <laughs> so I can't say much about the one in terms of identifying, but we're, we're into single single digit. Uh, of, of I, I mean, don't put words in your mouth. We, we will want to scrutinise this further at a later date, but that might suggest the redetermination process hopefully is doing its job. And whilst, would your feeling be that whilst it claimants might not like being unsuccessful because of eligibility criteria, whatever it is, they're at least getting a clear understanding of what the position is. And would that explain the low level of appeal? I suppose what I'm saying is, why do you think, I should just have asked you actually, apologies, why do you think there's such a low level of appeals rather than um, the, 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 the kind of build up to that? So my apologies. So only one, why do you think it's such a low level? Um, I think it's Probably too early to do proper analysis um, behind it. A whole factor, a range of factors. At, at, at one level, um, Best Start Grant is a relatively straightforward uh, benefit in terms of eligibility. Uh, so people, th there's, there's not a huge degree of subjectivity around about eligibility, so that's probably behind it as well. I would obviously say I think how we are dealing with the redetermination process leads to part of, of that as well. Uh, and again, in terms of the feedback that we have, um, we have had people doing that acknowledgement of saying, um, thank you for explaining why I'm not eligible. Um, so the work that's been done in the programme and user design and research to, to ensure that the way that we communicate what our letters actually say to people, I think, is having an impact of, of how that looks like. Um, again, hugely final question then, I wonder, Debbie, if you know what, it's to come in next a line of questioning. But again, really, really small numbers, but those successful redeterminations, any themes emerging in relation to that? The, the main one, um, I, I think, is around about in, in receipt of a qualifying benefit. Uh, so there is... Um, uh, 
people have to be not just eligible for an underlying benefit, but physically in receipt of it to, to qualify. So I, I think um, particularly around about UC, for, for example, um, from the information that we exchange with DWP, we might see that somebody uh, may have applied for, for UC but is not yet in receipt of it. And by the time it comes through that redetermination process, their circumstances might have changed. Uh, I want to be very careful in how I ask this next bit because I don't want to politicise the question. I really don't. But are delays to UC causing an issue in relation to the awards that you're seeking to make? And that's what's been picked up in the redetermination. Um, I wouldn't categorise it as delays, no. I, I, think, I think there's in all of these systems there is, there is going to be an inevitable bit of, of time lag. Um, and again, some of the early um, complaints around about CAS we saw, for example, um, where, where we take data from DWP, inevitably people change circumstances. So we've had people change their bank accounts. Um, I think the, there's been a recent parliamentary question around about have we paid any money to carers uh, south of the border, you know, there's a tiny percentage because they've actually moved in the preceding period. So there's always these movements uh, around about uh, and people's circumstances change. So I, I wouldn't, again, I think it's too early for us to really put any evidence behind what's what's underlying. Yeah, it's such a small sample as well. You're analysing. I appreciate that, Mr Wallace. Uh, Polly McNeil. Thank you. Um, good morning. Nice to see the committee again. Um, the area that does interest me is the area of redetermination. I didn't fully understand that statistic because in the papers it said a third of the applications were declined for Best Start Grant. But that figure that you spoke of, the convener, is that a different figure? You said a third of cases were redetermined. Could you just go over that with me again? So a third of Best Start Grant applications have been refused. Um, so so they, those have gone off and you know, decided either to accept that decision or to, to be redetermined or to ask for a redetermination. Of those ones that have asked for a redetermination, we're in low hundreds. And of that subset, we have um, approved a third. Uh, so we have overturned the decision. So where people had been given an original decision of you're, you're not eligible, we have overturned that in a third of cases. This is, all right. That, do you think that's high? A, I think, again, we're probably into to relatively early territory. I think it's too early and, and probably quite dangerous to, to kind of say one, one way or other. Um, I think it's also, um, we, we have been quite clear and, and you, you know, be conscious through the bill process. If we see something that we think needs corrected, we will correct it. And the redetermination process is specifically designed to, to make that as easy as possible. Uh, so I, I think it's too early to draw conclusions from it. Uh, but it's, a, it's something we I need to watch I appreciate you, uh, from your point of view, you're reluctant to do it. Just from a bystander's point of view, I think that does seem quite high. It may indicate that the redetermination process is, is working, but it does seem high. There must be an underlying reason for that, would be my, my own view. Um, I think it's back to the point around about UC, you know, finding people in payment. So it's not that the original decision was necessarily incorrect at the point it was made. It's people have now okay. come into payment right. of UC. Okay. Sorry, take me a minute to understand that. Yeah. On this question of redetermination, I think it's a very important process, one which the committee discussed at length at stage two and at stage three. So I'm interested to know, so um, what level of training, how have you approached this with staff? Because obviously the redetermination process is meant to be something completely fresh different from the DWP, so I'm just interested to know how you've gone about that. Um, well, it is, it is separate from our, our first decision making. So again, structurally within the agency, we have put that team in an entirely separate part of the organisation. Um, they've had the same training in terms of how the system operates, so they, they're aware of how people go through that first, first case of it. But the training that's been done has generally been, again, similar across the board to the rest of the organisation about um, just the ethos of trying to look at it from if people are entitled to a benefit, our role is to help them get their entitlement. Our role is not to defend a previous decision or our role is not necessarily to, to sort of guard in a different way. These are people's entitlements and our role is fundamentally to, to check and, and make sure that people are getting what they're entitled to. So we've done a lot of work in terms of getting people into that space. Um, but yeah, we, we're, I'm, I'm, I think trying to get... Um, behind what's causing you know the redeterminations and get some data around about it it's still it's very early stages which is why i'm being slightly hesitant just finally so the question of appeals and in the act 
So, they, so, so from the redetermination, if someone chooses to appeal, the paperwork is supposed to follow automatically. Has the work been done for that? Is that happening? It's a work in progress appeal rather than a finalised. But yes, we are, on that particular case, we are, we are working with the tribunal service around what, what needs to be prepared and Thank indeed you. the individual. Uh, I should just very briefly say on the redetermination process, one of the fundamentals we do is we, we pick up the phone to, to the client if that's appropriate and just talk through what, what further evidence they might have. What, why they appeal, you know, why they want a redetermination. So we ensure there's a very personal contact with with the client during that process. Thank you very much. Okay. Might just be worth uh, noting we've got uh, Shula Robinson, Arthur Allen, Mark Griffin, and Jeremy Balfour all wanting um, to, to, to ask ask questions. Time is limited. My apologies to members. We'll get them all in, but I think we'll be getting you back, Mr. Wallace, for an invite in, in probably short order because I think there's a, there's a desire to to have a, a, a longer evidence session. I know the delay is, is our issue and not yours. Uh, Shona Robinson. First of all, just to put on record uh, my uh, thanks for the, the achievement carried out by Dundee staff and successfully delivering the carers allowance supplement. I think that's a, a, a good start to the organisation. I guess it would be helpful, maybe in writing, if time's against us, just to hear a bit more about the challenges of the, the next benefits coming on stream and how you marry that with the growth of the organisation, both in terms of the new recruits, but also the skill mix required to deliver what is a beginning to be a kind of more varied variety of benefits some with different claim deadlines and some of the complexities around that. So is there a, presumably there will be, an organisational plan around that might be helpful for the committee to, to have sight of that, if, if that would be possible? Uh, I can certainly provide further information uh, uh, through correspondence. Um, I, I should also highlight our interim corporate plan is in the public domain as mm -hmm. well and we'll shortly be publishing our, our business plan for next year as well which will give some of that detail but I can set out some of those um, details. Do you, do you want to try and cover off any of those just, just now? Or? If time's against us I would be happy for it to be sent by correspondence. If... Very, very kind of you Shona. Uh, we'll see if Alice Allen will be as, as kind when he asks his question. <laughs> I'd be kind to send my correspondence as well. Um, my question was, was really um, about the, the delivery locally uh, of, of services and, and the fact that um, you, you've said that on your website uh, as an organisation, you said over time we aim to build up a network of locally based staff. I just wondered where planning had got on that on two fronts. One, from the point of view of the service user, and two, I say this shamelessly as a, a rural MSP, there's obviously a, a, a demand in, in rural Scotland for civil service job distribution um, without taking anything away from Dundee. Uh, is, is there any thought being given to how round the edges of what you do uh, people might be given the opportunities if they wish to move somewhere else to take their job with them? And there's very different parts of Mary Hill, I should point out. <laughs> Mr. Wallace, can you answer that question? Um, would you want me to answer that just now? Or, uh, or? Uh, it, it, well, let, let's... A couple of minutes... Mr Wallace, then we'll okay. move on to the next question. That would be good. I mean, in terms of where we are with um, local face-to-face -face delivery, um, it's one of those services that comes on stream when the later benefits, the, what we've referred to as the Wave 2 benefits, start to come on board. So it was never a service that's intended to support the, the first benefits, primarily because it wasn't deemed necessary to, to support people through that process in that face-to-face -face environment. So we're at still a very early stage of it. We, we have 19 individuals who are our lead local delivery uh, leads around Scotland, and their job is to have those conversations locally with local authority, with the third sector, with current service providers, and to really understand what the landscape looks like. What we've said through all of this is that our local delivery model isn't decide a model and plant it 32 times across Scotland, it is 32 conversations and more around about what's suitable for these environments. Um, the, the rural is a, is a good point. Um, we, we have, again, in, in starting those conversations, um, so the example, Argyll and Butte have been uh, particularly helpful to us in talking about how they currently service uh, you know, services, whether it's local authority or others from our, across Ireland, Argyll and Butte, so we're very conscious of, of the rural aspect to it as well. Um, I come back slightly to the outline business case in terms of the, the whole model of, of Dundee and Glasgow. Uh, and, you know, there was, there was an evidential 
piece of work as to why those are our main locations. Um, however, we are um, open to sort of mobile working for other uh, parts of the organisation where it's, where it's possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark Griffin. Thanks, Kavina. I would just to ask you um, about the statistics you intend to release for um, Best Start Grant uh, Pregnancy and Baby Payments. Um, just to ask what level of detail those statistics will go into, and I'm um, particularly interested that um, if you're able to produce statistics that would indicate, indicate to committee how many payments were paid to third and subsequent children in a family. Um, that, that is a question I, I, to give a proper answer and to take away and discuss with our analysts. Um, one of the reasons that we're, um, I'm not giving specific numbers today is that we uh, that there's a process of official statistics, obviously, to ensure their robustness and that they are uh, verifiable and, and evidential. Um, from, from the data that we see on a daily basis, um, we can identify some of those trends. So I see no reason why they wouldn't form part of a BSG statistics release. But if that's one I am able to take offline and, and clarify, uh, that, that would be useful. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, yeah, in a similar light, you may want to take both these questions away, and I'm very happy to have uh, a written answer. Um, I was slightly surprised yesterday um, when I asked the Cabinet Secretary um, about where people are coming to in regard to your, your new employees, uh, both one in regard to the diversity side, you know, the lived experience, and how many people have that, um, and also where, what their previous employment was before that. Now, it's probably was slightly unfair to ask that question in the chamber, but I wonder, have you done any ana analysis of uh, where people have come from and what kind of experience they had beforehand? And if a few people don't have it to your fingertips, could you provide that to the committee? The second area is um, the committee and I had a really helpful visit uh, down to uh, Scottish Government um, on Tuesday, which I, I actually found... And I said, I came back, I said that was actually one of the best meetings I've had since I've been here. Um, but the really interesting thing was the good working that's going on between Scottish Government and between yourself as an agency. And obviously Scottish Government are, because you're so new, doing quite a lot of the work at the moment in regard to data protection, in regard to um, how we're going to design forms, which obviously you are having input into. Just looking at your accounts, Obviously, that's a cost that's not been met by the agency, it's been met by Scottish Government. In your discussions with Audit Scotland, I appreciate Scottish Government aren't feeing you for that work, because that would be slightly... But will that be indicatively shown in your accounts to say, if we were doing this work, this would be X million pounds, so that we can get a true understanding of the cost that this is costing to bring all this into place, if that makes sense? Um, I'll take the first one away in terms of coming back back to you, Mr. Balfour. The, the second one, I think we can be fairly clear that you know we will our, our set of annual reports and accounts will be for what I am an accountable officer for. So when the agency went live, um, I am formally designated the accountable officer for the expenditure of the agency, and that's what our set of accounts will, will cover. Um, the financial memorandum, I'm, I'm turning to James in terms of the overall costs. Yeah, um, so I, I, th I think David's right. The, David is the accountable officer for Social Security Scotland and our annual report and accounts will only report on the costs in terms of running the system um, and the, the payments that we have made or, uh, as an agency. Um, implementation costs were described in the financial memorandum for the bill. You'll recall it was £308 million pounds, um, for a four-year programme. That was the, the initial high-level estimate. Um, the Expenditure against uh, Scottish Government budgets for implementation are reported in the Scottish Government's accounts, um, which again are laid before Parliament. The one, the one area that you will see in due course is the assets that the that the programme is producing um, within the Scottish Government will at some point transfer into the agency um, and become become assets on David's balance sheet, and you will see that in due course. Um, but that that will not include the full extent of expenditure on implementation you will have to get that from the Scottish Government's accounts. I mean, I suppose my only slight concern is, in, is around the transparency of all of this, is that, yes, you can go and find it somewhere in a page 108 of a document or whatever, but I think, it, I think 
is it up to the Scottish Government to let us know of that budget, which of, of estimation of 308 million, how much has that been spent already? That, that would be a Scottish Government issue, not a agency issue, is that right? Essentially, yeah. and Alison might want to come up on that. We, we aren't, we, the agency doesn't commission the government and, turn, and build back services. Alison, her team and the director in a wider sense are mm -hmm. Scottish Government civil servants who are working on social security. So as, as David and, and James have said, the social security programme is a change programme and that's the space where we design and build the services that we then pass to David to deliver. Um, obviously we design and build those services with David and with his team. Um, but yeah, the £308 million identified in the financial memorandum are start-up costs that the Scottish Government um, are driving at the moment for the development and design of the services that David in the agency will then deliver. OK, thank you, Convener. OK, Alison Johnson. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Um, I'd just like to ask on the, the issue of local delivery, you will be, you know, you won't, it, it, it's not all about standalone social security offices. Um, you'll be working in, I suppose, in different venues with different organisations. So I'd just like to understand a bit more about what that might look like, but also um, with regard to the welcome focus on dignity and respect. You know, perhaps you might not, you know, you may not be working with another organisation that is that has that same commitment. So I'd just like you to touch on those two issues, please. I, so I, I would say it, it's more than just a, you know, we will work with others and, uh, and not about our offices. It, the presumption is complete the other way that we will, we will be embedded uh, where people are already going to access services. Um, and those are early conversations that our delivery leads have started to have. Um, so, so there are two things around about our local staff. Is one where we base them on one where they operate their services from, uh, and across Scotland we've seen, seen some fantastic examples of, you know, is it libraries, health centres, wherever people are travelling around to to ensure there's a joined up service. Um, on the whole, um, people are really responsive to us. Um, you becoming part of a, of a holistic sort of joined up service around about that. That oversimplifies it, of course. Uh, there's an incredibly complex landscape. Um, we've already spoken to over 600 individual organisations who sort of view themselves in some way related to that sort of space as well. Um, so it is phenomenally complex. Um, but yes, we intend to be in places um, where people are already going to access services. But um, I, I would agree on, on your other point, those places also have to ensure that they deliver against our values of, of uh, dignity, fairness and respect as well. Um, we've tried to do this um, on our, perm, our, our interim locations as well. So again, where we're basing people in Dundee and, and Glasgow, it's no accident that they're within shared local authority buildings uh, and you know where services are already being delivered to, to clients as well. So that, that's a theme which we want to explore further. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Chair Valentine. Yes, good morning. Um, I just want to revisit the money again, which I know. <laughs> um, I've been looking at, at obviously the figures that we've been given over the period, um, and on our papers for today, we've got an estimate of the steady state running costs. And uh, um, just for clarification purposes, before we go further into discussion, I'm taking it this is all revenue figures, that capital doesn't really come into it, because if I'm reading it correctly, there's no asset transfer of IT as such because that seems to be a shared service cost. Is, am I correct, correct in saying that? Uh, the, I, the current IT is shared service. Or, or, or um, well, it, it, it just in, in your figure, in your running costs, certainly for, for 1920, it refers to shared service cost, including IT, HR, procurement. That would tend to be sort of desktop services that are delivered to us by the Scottish Government. So uh, aside from our arrangement, um, you know, working closely with the programme, we also, wherever possible, take shared services. Uh, and that in the main is shared services from, from the Scottish Government. So as people sit, the hardware, um, the connectivity on their desks is, is what that re relates to. Right. So when we look at the estimated steady state running costs, which are estimated at between 144 and 156 million, that is purely revenue. Yeah. Um, what I'm interested in then is in the relationship between the, the cost of running the agency and what you actually deliver. Um, so, first of all, are you comfortable that figure is, is correct? Has there been any alteration to that figure at the moment? Those, those figures um, come from the outline business case, which I'd, I'd referenced earlier. Um, so that public 
um, document is, is still the, the source of estimate that we're looking and working from in that sense. Um, there will be, uh, because of the way this operates, there will be changes inevitably around about uh, this service design that has an impact. Uh, some of those will be you know, very, very small. Some will be large conversations that happen in places, commitments to a free phone, for example. All, all of these things on the edges, commitment to what assessments actually look like, where they're going to be delivered. Um, you know, if, we, if we give people choice around about assessment, if we want to move any face-to-face -face assessments closer to people's homes, all of these things are service design uh, conversations which in some way have a consequence for, for running costs. But those are, are, those are the current figures which we are operating uh, against. That's against the full delivery package of um, the £308 million pounds worth of, of benefits. Um, that current two billion. So, so um, yeah, it would be £3.3 3 .3 billion pounds of benefits, um, £308 million pounds of it, Scottish Government implementation costs to set up the, the systems and processes required for delivery. So there, there, is, a, there is an implementation cost to build the systems. Um, and then there is an annual running cost to, to, to pay out the benefits under that system every year. But the, the benefits in administration will be, or at the time that this was written, was around £3.3 billion pounds under a steady state. And did you, have a, did you have a target figure in terms of your planning around the relationship between cost and delivery? These, James, James might correct me, these, these figures were sort of built up essentially from the existing operating model of what we knew around about DWP delivery in Scotland as well. Uh, so, so they were sort of built up from, from that. Uh, so we didn't, the, the, in constructing that, the target wasn't to arrive at a percentage of administration cost to, to benefit expenditure, it, but it was built up from effectively what, what is the current system. It did not to be vastly different in the long run. I think... On those numbers, it's around about 5%, yeah, about 5%. Uh, which is in, in line with um, the existing yeah, system. DWP are around 3%, aren't they? Currently, so. Not for non-pension yeah. benefits. Um, so the financial memorandum to the Social Security Bill, the Scottish Government did make estimates of what it potentially costs DWP to administer non-pension benefits as a proportion of the benefits that they administer in Scotland. Our estimation was 6.3%, um, and our estimation for Sco Social Security Scotland was 5%. Um, that's not intended to be a stark comparison between DWP and Social Security Scotland. It's, it's supposed to be an indicative figure that the basis of our estimates is sensible and reliable, that we would expect to be comparable um, broadly. But the current, the current agency agreement we have is running at about 2.2%, is it not? For carers' allowance? It yeah. is. Yeah. Um, as, as a proportion of, of the carers' allowance, it, it, it will be in that region. Um, however, that is not the full range of uh, activities that are required to deliver So we've got a good allowance. deal, really, at the so, moment. Sorry? So we've got a good deal right now in terms um, of I, I, I think it's. A, I, I think DWP have been fair, um, but I, I think it is not the, the the work that is involved in delivering carers allowance in Scotland is is not solely the agency agreement. Mm. Um, there is work that is carried out by Social Security Scotland and within the Scottish Government to ensure that, that Scottish recipients of carers allowance get their carers allowance, even though there's an agency ag agreement with DWP. And, it, and some of it come back to your earlier discussion that's mm -hmm. based on the, that that is the service uh, mm -hmm. and changes to it in any way, shape or form are entirely out of, of scope. Okay. Thank you. I won't ask any more. Uh, perfect timing. That, that was uh, eight, eight different questions from, from MSPs in a relatively short period of time. So I thank MSPs for their, their, their focus in relation to that and for your concise answers uh, as witnesses. But time is upon us. So can I, can I thank you, Mr Wallace, and uh, both Mr Wallace and Alison Byrne uh, for coming along this morning. We hope to see you back probably in that, relatively short order because I think there's a thirst to, to obviously expand on some of those lines of question. But we really appreciate your attendance this morning. Uh, we now move to agenda item six, Social Security Scotland, which we previously agreed to take in private. So we now move into private session. Thank you.